Welcome everybody. Okay. Oh, can you see him? Can you see the little head down here? Bob Ross is with us today and he got a haircut. Here he is. And now he has eyes. And so you might hear him bark today because he's just discovered that there are mirrors and there are puppies in the mirror. And he doesn't know why there are puppies in the mirror. So we're just going to bring that in today of this is Bob. And Bob's going to do what Bob's going to do. Having said that, I want you to do what you're going to do. Welcome to Stress Reset. This is the only Stress Reset class we will have this week. And continuing along with the theme for the week, we're going to practice resetting our stress reflex, working with a stress fever from the lens of the low body. So if you've been with me for a while over previous uh, stress reset classes, there's going to be some repeat here because there are some really powerful and important practices um, all having to do with the low body, right? So let's, let's go ahead and get started. We're taking a diversion from how we have been playing. <laughs> He's going to go see that puppy. Uh, from how we have been playing and exploring. And we're going to be on the floor today. So if the floor doesn't work for you, you can be on the bed. You can be, if you've got a bench you would like to be on, you can be on that. So let's go ahead and get started. We hold a lot of stress in our lower body. And in particular, we hold a lot of sympathetic stress reflex. I'll say it again, I've said it numerous times. I like to talk about stress in terms of reflex and fever. So stress reflex. We all know what reflexes are. If I go to the doctor and I have um, my knee tested and they hit it with that little rubber mallet and the knee moves, that's a reflex. If you're startled, we go through a startle reflex. We know that that is just something unconscious our body is doing to keep us safe. It's just like, oh, when this thing happens, my body does this. Well, stress is the same. Uh, stress is the same, that it's not something um, weird. It's something, Bobby, come here, please. I am so sorry. Live, live class, um, the stress reflex is something that's just sort of happening in the body, where something is happening in our environment and our body is perceiving it as a disruption, as a threat, as something to be wary of, and it all happens unconsciously. And that unconscious reflex then begins to spike a stress fever. Now, if we think of fever fevers, we all know that if you have a fever of like 99 or 99.5, you don't really need to do anything about that. In fact, we know that that fever is probably serving a purpose. It's probably something healthy. It's um, uh, working through infection or virus or something. It's um, that there's an inflammatory process going on somewhere. And you just kind of go, well, that's happening. When it gets up to 100, 101, and you go, okay, I should take a Tylenol, maybe I do my cold compress or whatever it is you do, you kind of know how to work with that. But when we wake up and we're surprised with those 105 degree temperatures, 103, and we take the Tylenol and it goes down to 103, it goes down to 101, you're like, oh my gosh, I still have a fever and I've done, I've done the things. Well, that is often where we begin to notice our stress, is when our stress has spiked in fever up to 105. It's like, I'm so stressed and now I don't even know what to do and I'm surprised by it. What I'm encouraging you to do is start to take an inventory of what your body feels like as it's going through the stress fever process. And a lot of that is held down in the legs, so down in the hips, down in the feet, down in the knees, and the pelvic floor, in the lower gut, all of that will begin to tell us um, when we are approaching an unhealthy fever. So I'm going to give you some protocols, some practices, some ideas of how to begin to metabolize and work through that stress fever. 
as well, most of us are probably going to be cooking, shopping, being with family, being out and about, something that we haven't been doing recently. And so over the next few days, so these are also practices to have in your back pocket to share with other people or to do um, in order to be better able to be with people. So let's go ahead and get started. I want you to pick your favorite foot. Doesn't matter which foot it is. And we're gonna take our thumbs. And if you go, so I have my toes and then I have this upper, I have like the, the uh, forefoot here, the ball of the foot. And then I have this arch of the foot. If I take my thumbs right into the top of the arch, the bottom of the balls of the feet, and I just begin to kind of push in through there, that is from a reflexology standpoint related to diaphragm, related to where the gut meets the chest. And it's a really beneficial place to begin to massage or just massage your feet. <laughs> you can do it with your hands. You can put a ball on the floor. You can have someone else massage your feet for you. You're just going to take and do a little massage through there. I want you to just take an inventory of how that feels. Do you like it? Does it feel like something that you maybe want to do? If so, remember it and keep practicing it. Good. Same side, we're going to take your thumb, and if I drew a line from my heel through my Achilles up the back of the calf to the back of the knee, well, if you go about halfway into your calf there and just kind of push into that a bit, there's a reflexology point in there that is really helpful for stress. And you can kind of play with it a little bit. You can go down or you can go up. And it's here's the thing about reflexology points. You know when you hit, right? So if it's like, I don't feel anything there, it's because you're on the wrong place. So get a little exploratory. Go south, go north, go east, go west, right, left, up and down, deeper, more shallow. And just begin to search for it. When you hit it, you're going to go, oh, right there. That's where it is. And I'm pushing, if I was on a scale of one to 10, I'm pushing at about a four. So I don't need to go super deep. Deep tissue work is not all it's cracked up to be. Just a little bit, like your body is smart enough to just get it when it hits it. So I'm just kind of pushing through there a little bit. And then I want you to just notice any differences between your two sides, any differences in how you feel. And then let's go and do the other side. Same thing. I'm going to start off with that little point underneath the ball of the foot, uh, right above the arch of the foot. And then we'll work our way up towards the calf, just kind of working through there a bit. Good. And then just kind of notice what you notice. From there, we're gonna have you lie all the way down on your back. We're gonna go through this TRE practice, tension and trauma release exercise, TRE. We're gonna go through the practice. Um, there's a few different uh, uh, pit stops along the practice we're gonna move through. And then I'm gonna talk about it afterwards. So I want you to just take an inventory as we lay down of what you notice in your hips, what you notice in your legs, what you notice about your body, about your cognitive body, your emotional body, all the things we're used to in this class. Lay all the way down and we're going to bring the soles of the feet together. And my knees are not going to just fully stretch open. It's not a flexibility competition. But I'm also not going to try to keep them together. They're going to go casually somewhere in between, all the way open and fully closed. Closed. From there, 
All of my toes are touching all of my toes. The outside edge of my foot tries its best to touch the outside edge and my heels touch my heels. And then they push, they squeeze together. From there, I squeeze my butt cheeks until I feel my pelvis rock so that my low back is closer to the ground. So there's a squeeze together, squeeze of the butt cheeks, and then I push down into the floor to begin to bridge up. Now it doesn't need to be the biggest bridge, but it's certainly lifting up. So there's lots of tension going on. I squeeze, I squeeze, I push, I squeeze, I squeeze, I squeeze. And I'm gonna hold for 45 seconds to a minute. Another 15 seconds. Squeezing, pushing, holding. Five, four, three, two, slowly lowering down. Now, before you bring your knees together, ground yourself, hold. Bring your knees one inch closer together. Then one more inch, inch by inch until you feel your legs want to or begin to vibrate, shake, or tremor. What we're doing is eliciting or causing what is called the therapeutic tremor. And we'll talk about that more in a bit. Tremoring, shaking. Don't worry if you're not shaking or tremoring. We'll talk about that in a bit, just see if you can, just be with the practice. Now, if you're watching mine, I'm not making this happen. This is simply how my legs are responding to the experience they just had. The trimmer wants to move anywhere else, I allow it. For me, it's wanting to go up the spine a bit. Now, I would normally let this go. For the sake of class, we're going to repeat because sometimes on the second repetition, you are able to go deeper into it if you haven't felt it at all. So let's do that. Open up, squeeze, squeeze, tuck, lift, and hold. We're going to go for 30 seconds. Five, four, three, two, coming down, inch by inch, trimmer. When you're ready to stop, simply slide the leg straight, flex your feet, and relax. Notice what you notice. And when we're ready, bend your knees, let your feet be wider than your body, and your knees will be together. So it's the opposite of the posture we were just in. Squeeze the knees together, Squeeze the butt cheeks, lift up, push your feet down, squeeze, squeeze, hold. 
Really bring those legs together, squeeze, squeeze. Can you get your knees more together? Can you get all 10 toes down on the floor? Can you get your heels down on the floor, the balls of the feet down on the floor? Squeeze, squeeze, 15 more seconds. Five, four, three, two, slowly lowering back down. Now this one's different. We bring our feet and our knees together and the knees open up inch by inch until they find a tremor. Couple more breaths, just being here with it. Now you can slide your legs straight and flex your feet if you're done with this, or join me for another repetition. Squeeze, squeeze, push. Five more seconds. Turn the volume up on it. Squeeze, push, squeeze, push. Slowly working your way down, bringing your legs together. Open inch by inch. Look for the tremor. Now, if we weren't in class, I'd let this go on for another three to five minutes. But since we are in class, and this is something for you to repeat on your own, this is not just a do it when James is here moment. This is a take it if this works for you and do it at home and let yourself shake tremor for longer. For the sake of class, slide your legs straight, flex your feet flat, relax, and just notice what you notice. I'm going to follow this up with windshield wiping my feet right, left, right, left, right, left. And it's just going to wiggle my body. Now, that's one wave frequency, right? It's like a snake or an S wave. If you like that, keep doing that. If not, ground yourself, push your heels into the floor, point, flex, point, flex. And you can see if you can jiggle so it's more like an up and down wave. So I can go side to side or up and down. Keep doing the wiggle or the jiggle. Keep doing the movement as I talk. And if you need a break, just pause and breathe into the body. I want to talk for a moment about why these practices. So I introduced at the top of this the idea of stress reflexes and stress fevers. When we have that 101 degree temperature, right? That is typically a sign for the body to go through like a um, fight or flight moment. When we spike all the way up to that 105, that's usually a freeze moment. I don't want you to think about even just how a fever feels. When you've got that 101, you're kind of um, anxious, you're ready to, to do something about it. Um, then you go through phases where you just like recoil and you're like, I gotta take this, I gotta do this. When you were up at like 105, you just, you're, you're dead to the world, right? We tend to hold a lot of stress in that 101 degree thing. 
And a lot of that goes down into the legs. Fight energy is sympath sympathetic fight energy is more often stuck in the upper body. When we want to push, shove, when we wish we had responded um, in a pushback sort of way. Flight energy, when we wish we had ran, when we wish we had moved away, when we wish we had walked away, when we wish we could get out of there, is more often held in our leg energy. And so our leg areas, our leg cells. So neither one is bad, neither one is good. It's just simply what is. So we worked a lot last week with processing through the upper body. And these lower body things are about how do we, if my body, if the stress and the trauma that I'm holding in my lower body is because I wished I had ran, because I wished I had moved away, because I wished I had left the situation, then I have to figure out a way to contract those muscles, to allow them to move, to shake, to process through that uninitiated, that unprocessed movement that my body was telling me to do in the moment. Anecdotally, if I'm in a meeting and something rude is said, and my impulse is, well, I really wish I had just got up and walked out of the room, but I'm an adult and I'm an employee, and so I don't. I sit there, and then I wonder why later on that night my legs hurt, my stomach is upset, my hips hurt, my back is starting to ache. Well, it's because my body knew, my nervous system knew that the best thing to do in the moment would be to get up and walk out. But you have to adult yourself through the world. So I'm not saying get up and walk out of every meeting, but know that if you had that impulse, maybe that night you go home and do some of these exercises. If you're sitting at the Thanksgiving table and that rude thing is said, that different political viewpoint is said, you're like, oh, I just want to walk out, but that's uncle so-and-so. I can't go into your room and do these exercises to help metabolize and process. What we're doing here is contracting and squeezing, we're mobilizing, we're honoring the urge to move through the squeeze. Then think about when you have experienced some sort of deep trauma, deep stress. We call it shock, right? If you're hit by a car and we know that the body's going, like that's in the common vernacular, your body's going through shock where it's gonna shake, it's gonna shimmy, it's gonna tremor a bit. That is the therapeutic tremor. That is your body metabolizing and process and bringing, bringing itself back online. Dogs do it. Bob does it every day. Yesterday, he got groomed. It was a traumatic experience for him. As he was going to sleep that night, he was kind of shaking and shimming all around. We've seen this. You watch National Geographic. You see the gazelle almost get caught. It gets up, it shakes, and then it bolts off. It is a sign of the fever. It is a resetting. And we just don't allow ourselves the opportunity to do that. Then following it up with that rhythmic motion is a way of then resonating, getting the body back online to go, oh, we're okay here. We are totally, totally fine. So to access that therapeutic tremor, let it contract, let it shake, let it do its thing. And then following up with um, a rhythmic movement is a way of getting things back on track. And you can do the side to side, you can do the jiggle, you can just come up and do seaweed spine. That's why we do seaweed spine. They're just tools to help you reset that impulse, that fever that your body's automatically going to reflexively go through. Now, if it didn't happen for you today, these are habits. We, you got to get over the barrier of thinking it's weird of thinking it's not for you, of thinking you can't do it, because if you're a human and you're here, your nervous system knows how to do it, you're just unpracticed at it. So if it's interesting and you're hearing this and going, that's me, it just it didn't happen for me today, why didn't it happen? It's because you haven't practiced it. So practice, 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 and it will start off shimmying, shaking a little bit, and it will get more and more robust. I'm at the point now where I don't need to do the TRE practices. I can just allow my body to shake and tremor when it needs to. I don't second guess it. Same is true for fidgeting. If you feel an impulse to fidget, I grew up with a mom, nothing gave me greater, and I say this a lot, nothing gave me greater joy than telling my mom she was wrong about when we were growing up, if we fidgeted, it drove her insane. But now what I know is fidgeting is our way of processing stress and trauma. And fidgeting is one of the best ways to burn extra calories. So if you're trying to lose those five pounds, fidget more often. It is the best way to lose that. So wanted to give you some practices for that. Let's move up the body a little bit and into our belly 
area. I like using warmed props, so a heating blanket, uh, like a rice bag of some sort, some sort of weighted thing because it feels really good for the belly. This class, in my opinion, is all about giving you tools with out props, so things you can do on your own without having to buy extra stuff. So we're going to do it with our hands, but you can, if you want, use something weighted. Go ahead and lie all the way down. We're going to warm our hands up. And we're going to place them onto the upper belly, right onto the stomach area. Again, where we hold a lot of stress. And I'm just gently going to push into it. On a scale of one to 10, I'm not pushing at maybe a three here. So it's not heavy. Then, and I've got my hands working together, I'm going to push towards the thumb aspect and then the left and then the pinky and then the right. It's like I'm making, drawing a circle around my actual stomach. And I'm going to pause wherever it feels important. I can't tell you where that is. You have to know it. Important is going to feel really good. It's going to feel really bad. It's going to feel like, huh, what is this? Or that feels different. You got to get used to paying attention to that 99 degree thing versus being screamed at by the 105 degree thing. Otherwise, you're going to get stuck in that cycle again and again and again. So where it feels like a 9900 degree, oh, that feels different moment and just be there kind of gently pushing down into it. Now we can go into some of our previous practices from the few weeks. I can allow my sits bones to be wide. I can go into my heart lung hug. I can relax my eyes and my tongue. Once that no longer feels interesting, continue to move. Now, if that feels good, keep doing that. Or both hands are gonna now circulate to the left, down towards the left hip, toward the pubic bone, over to the right, up towards the stomach, drawing a circle, always in this, <coughs> pardon me, always in this direction, left to bottom, to right to top. It is the direction of peristalsis, or the way your gut moves. Pausing wherever feels important. Now, keep doing that. Whichever version of that is working best for you. We hold so much tension in our gut um, because it's a vulnerable area. There's a lot of <clears throat> that vagus nerve that we all often talk about interdigitates or connects down into the gut a lot because it's constant. That's where your nourishment is coming from. That's where there's a lot of important functions going on down there. So when we have colloquially the terms of like gut instinct, gut wisdom, gut knowledge, it's, there's a nerve for that. It's a literal thing. So sometimes we tend to hold, and a lot of that will come from the legs and into the pelvic floor, that unmetabolized, that uncontextualized, unprocessed fight or flight stuff, tightens up the hip joints, tightens up the pelvic floor, <clears throat> tightens up the gut. We stop breathing, which tightens up the top. And so all of this just gets stuck. So just going through and having a feel good moment and pausing. Now, when I do this with people, this out of everything, this gut thing, I will often even hear in the comments, I'm sure someone today is gonna go, huh, I got a little emotional. I got a little sad. I felt something come up it's because we hold, <clears throat> uh, where we hold uh, physical sensation and emotional sensation and all of that, they, our uh, Western ideas of wellness like to take and separate those. So this is a psychological thing. This is a physiological thing. The body doesn't know the difference. It's just going, huh, this thing feels like this moment and it's gonna bring up this thing. We're gonna morph over here. From... So yeah, you might feel emotional. 
it doesn't mean that you are sad about something in the moment. It doesn't mean that there is a an undiagnosed trauma. It just simply means that your body has been holding on to something and it's now realizing it's holding on to something and you can be with it. You can, you can lean into that and help metabolize it. Or if it feels like it's too much right now, let off the gas a little bit and be there. Knowing you can always return to it whenever you want. It's not causing more bad stuff. You're amazingly resilient. You are amazing. Your body has so much fortitude and strength to it that, that just to acknowledge it is often enough. So I wanted to give you that. Now to finish off, I'd like everyone to just sit up and just take a little inventory. You have some homework. It's the same homework as if you were in Move Lab. I just heard a podcast by Dr. Andrew Huberman, who is um, a neuroscientist at Stanford, Huberman Lab podcast. He is the foremost expert on neuroscience. He's the one bringing it out into the world right now and um, demystifying it. He had a whole uh, podcast on gratitude and gratitude practices. And as I mentioned yesterday, the idea that a gratitude practice is a list of things that you have gratitude for is now um, an antiquated gratitude practice. We should all be counting our blessings. We should all be thankful. We should all have gratitude, but that doesn't do the thing that we often think it does. When we have gratitude practices, we're often trying to make our nervous system more what's called pro-social, more engaged, more curious, more uh, immune system healthy, more ready to go. And the way a gratitude practice optimally should go to be more pro-social is to receive gratitude to be on the receiving end of authentic and truthful thankfulness. So you carry within you powerful medicine. Your homework is to over the next weekend, over this Thanksgiving holiday, if that's what you celebrate, um, is to tell someone how much gratitude you have for something very specific, something they did for you, something you're thankful for, because it makes their system more pro-social. You are giving them medicine by telling them that. And in return, you're going to get it back from them. And if you don't have someone like that, to find a story either in your history where you can remember being authentically thanked or having gratitude expressed to you, or a story where you've heard it, a podcast, a book you've read, a TV show you've watched, and to just be with that and how that thing made you feel. It is free medicine that we can give to each other that will directly help reset our stress. So thank you so much. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week and tell someone that you are thankful for them. Thank you, everybody. We appreciate you. Great. Thank you so much, James. So fabulous. Great practice today, very helpful for me. I hope everyone um, has a great Thanksgiving. We'll hang out for a couple of minutes, see if there's any questions that come in. I did want to, I don't know if this is gonna work, but I found a picture of Bob Ross on Facebook where you can actually see his eyes. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I don't know if you guys, can you see that? He actually has eyes. Hey, Bobby, come here. Come here, Bob. Come here, baby. Come on. Okay, so oh, now you you let, me, let me go grab him real quick. Come here. He wanted to teach the class today, clearly. Oh my gosh. Well, like I said, literally, here he is. <gasps> There's he is. The Cito Diddle eyes. They're still hidden. Oh, I saw them. <laughs> so cute. He um <laughs> yeah. So as you can see, his coat is totally different. Mm-hmm because he's roan coated. So roan coat is brown and then it grows out white. So now he's more brown, but we had him trim around his eyes because he was just getting more and more anxious, not being able to see. But <laughs> it's so funny, you know how no normally dogs behaviors change after they get a haircut, they're more frisky or they're right. sad or whatever it is. Bob was like rediscovering the world as a puppy, <laughs> like his puppy puppy pictures, he had hair covering his eyes. So our old dog would have hair grow into his eyes and then he would like stop playing as much and you'd cut it and he'd be fine. Bob literally has never known the world without hair in his eyes. Right. So yesterday when he got home, like nothing looked familiar on a walk, nothing looked familiar. He barked at himself for like 10 minutes in the mirror yesterday. And then over there, he's never seen, I guess, 
over there, there's a mirror. Over here, there are mirrors. And so now he's like, why are there dogs in the studio? He's why having his dogs? very own orientation practice. He really is. So he's <laughs> in the process of rediscovering the world as now a five-month-old dog. So wow. that's that's where we're at. Oh, that's fabulous. Well, we, we can take something from that as well. Rediscovering yes. the world each yes. day. With Pull the hair friends. away from your eyes and rediscover yes. the world. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, I don't see any um, questions. So thank you guys so much. Um, oh, you're very welcome, Kim. Um, you're all very welcome. Thank you. And we'll see you guys next Tuesday for Move Lab. Yep. And I think right. next week is play week. Play, so that's play right. a lot. All right. Week. Okay. Bye, Raven. Have Bye, a everybody. Bye. Bye, Bob. <laughs>